different things uh, uh, for Thanksgiving, but the main thing for us is to be what? I mean, it's a no-brainer. Be thankful. Duh. Thank you, God. Uh, I am grateful. I'm thankful for my mom, and I'm thankful for my my grandma, and I'm thankful for everything, and I'm thankful for my dad, and my and, and I love to take my bath because I have lots of bubbles, and I love it so much, and I can't even stop swimming in it. So I love my brother and my dog and everything and I love my um, grandma and ice cream and and candy and some broccoli and some anything. <laughs> I am grateful. I am grateful. God loves it when we're grateful. God loves cheerful givers. He loves cheerful speakers. He loves cheerful livers. God, not the kind of liver that you eat, like liver and onions once a year, but you know, people who live for the Lord. God loves for us to say thank you. He loves for us to be grateful. God loves gratitude. Thankful people know what they're thankful for. That's kind of a no-brainer too, isn't it? Thankful people know what they're thankful for. Do you know what you're thankful for? Psalm 100 verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are, the, we are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture. Verse 4, enter His gates with thanksgiving, with singing. Enter His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. Verse 5, for the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. In this little passage in, in Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5, I find that God hears me, and God made me, and God wants me, and God knows me, and God saved me, and God loves me. Go to the next slide, guys. God loves you. God made you. God hears you. God knows you. He saved you. He is here. Um, what is God doing in all of this? Just a, just a, a, a quick jump through, through the 100th Psalm. But you find all through Scripture, don't you, that God loved you and that you can love Him back. God knows you. You can know Him back. God lived for you. You can live for Him. Jesus died for you so that you can live for Him. It, it, it's, it's a, if I'm looking at it from God's point of view, it looks like a parasitic relationship. Is that the right word? Not symbiotic. Symbiotic is, is uh, we, we glom onto each other. We hang onto each other, and it works out best for both of us. Symbiotic relationships are good. It's a win-win. But when you have parasites, not so good. You know, not so good. When I look at it from my point of view, thank you, God. Who comes out on the winning side? You know, who's given up the most? But God doesn't see me as a parasite. Thank you, God. He sees me as one of his kids. He sees me as one of his chosen ones because I is special, right? Because I'm so cute. Because I'm so, yeah, all that. God loves me because he picked me. God loves you because he chose you. That's what the Bible says. You couldn't have come to Jesus had God the Father not selected you. I don't understand the whole doctrine of election and how all of that works, but the Bible says you can't come unless he draws you. And if you've come to Jesus Christ, evidently he has. You've come to Jesus Christ. You, you've recognized you're sinful. We've recognized that we are in deep need of a Savior. He gave us the faith to believe. We stepped over that line and gave our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, and then life is better. Smooth sailing, right? No problems? Is that the way it is? Not for most of us. Of course not. Because this life is not about you. This life is, this life is not about my comfort. This life is about Him. Jesus Christ, dead, buried, and resurrection. It's about Him glorified. And most of us really don't... I mean, we get it. We're in church and, Amen, yes, amen, glory to God, yes, amen. But living out there in the real world, we, we kind of feel like we're getting short-sighted. We're getting the short end of the stick when life isn't working out. You know, when, when, when things happen, when we think that bad things are happening to good people. And remember what the Bible says, there's none to do with good. There's, there's no one good, right? But God hears you. Yeah, but things aren't working out like they should. I, I think he doesn't even hear me when I pray, but God wants you. I feel like I'm in the middle of this mess and, and God doesn't even know where I am. God knows you. God went out of his way to save you. 
Jesus loves you, the Bible says. Thankful people know what they're thankful for. Uh, just combing through this passage a little bit, what can I be thankful for? Uh, I can be thankful for broccoli, not I. I can be thankful for my mom and bass because there are lots of bubbles and all the things that the little girl said. But looking at it as a child of God, God wants us to get to the place where it's okay to be thankful for my house and it's okay to be thankful for my candy and it's okay to be thankful for my, you know, whatever you have. But at some point, he wants you to put on the spiritual lenses and be able to see, oh, more. Uh, thank you, God, for my life. And thank you, God, for uh, blessings. And thank you, God, for answered prayer. But at some point, let's see if these stools hold me up. He wants you to get to the place where you're not just looking at life from survival. And you're not just looking at life through the lens of success where thank you, God, for all the good things you're doing for me. <laughs> I'm not surfing, I'm balancing. Thank you, God, for my struggles. Thank you, God, for my difficulties. Thank you, God, that you let that rough thing happen to me. Thank you, God, that that prayer didn't get answered. Who the, who the heck thinks like that? Crazy preachers? Only when we're preaching. We don't think like this in the real world. In the real world, I'm like you. I've got to buy gas and groceries too. Uh, and maybe, uh, God, I really need. Oh, God, I really appreciate that you heard me when I... But at some point, when you start looking at life from God's point of view, things look different. And the blessings you appreciate, but you recognize that there are times that God withholds, not because He doesn't love, not because He doesn't care, not because He hasn't heard, but because he has so much more for you. And it's not just your comfort. It's your conformity to Jesus Christ. And sometimes that means letting you struggle just a little bit longer, Peter says. You struggle just a little bit longer. You suffer a while, and then the Lord Jesus Christ will establish you, Peter says. I understand you've got to live your life. Did I do that? No. Oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I understand you've got to live life. It's wonderful when you thank God for your blessings. But when you get to the place where you can thank God that things aren't working out the way you want and you trust and believe Him that they're working out the way He wants, then you've got something to be thankful for. But right now, we're just talking, it's just us, right? You can be thankful that God made you. Acts 17, 25. He gives life to all, uh, what is that? He giveth to all life and breath. And to all things, Genesis 1, 27, uh, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them, Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds human blood by, uh, what is that? My, mine's kind of missing here. Uh, whoever sheds human blood uh, by humans shall their blood be shed for in the image of God has God made mankind. You know what that is in Genesis 9, 6, by the way? This is capital punishment. That's what that is. God is merciful. Uh, you think of the example of the, of the woman taken in adultery. Wow, what a different time we live in. There was a time when adultery was a capital offense. Adultery was punishable by death. And they brought a woman who was guilty of adultery. They didn't bring the dude. They just brought the woman. It shows you where their minds were. Uh, they were just looking to trap Jesus. They brought this woman caught in adultery. And they said, Jesus, the Old Testament law says you have to stone her. You have to execute her, right? And you remember this is the time that Jesus knelt down in the sand and he's drawn little pictures of fishies and doodles in his name. You think that's what he's doing? I, I, I bet he's, it doesn't say. I wonder if maybe he's writing, he's looking up at one person and looking at another and maybe writing down some big sin that they're aware of. Huh? But the Bible says that he says, you're right. The Old Testament law says that a capital offense is to be treated as a capital offense, capital punishment for a capital offense. Let you who is without sin pull the trigger on the first uh, execution rifle. Uh, pull the lever on the gallows rope. Uh, push the button or the syringe button for the lethal injection. Let you who is without sin cast the first stone. Right? So what was he saying? Sin can, man, they're just, they're just hey, boys will be boys. Girls will be, people are people. Is that what Jesus said? No, it's a sin and it's wrong. But we have an instance of a capital offense worthy of a, a, a capital crime, worthy of capital punishment, and Jesus allowed grace. Go and sin no more, he said to her. But this, 
is why we believe in capital punishment. We believe there are times when we choose to extend mercy. But we don't just make this up because we're barbaric. God says human life is to be treasured. It's to be valued. Human life at the baby side and at the almost baby side. Human life at the grown-up side and the way grown-up side. How old are you, Dad? He's going to be 83 in a couple of days. My goodness. He's old enough to be, like, dead. <laughs> what does the Bible say? God, God promises, what, 70 years, 80 years? 100 years, 120 years? Uh, I, the oldest vet I uh, read the other day was, what, 107, is 107 years old, something like that? Uh, my goodness. But at some point, James tells us, like if we don't know ourselves, life is just a, what, just a vapor. And we pass, we, we die. Now, the Bible says that's not all to life. This ain't all there is. You leave this life and you live forever someplace in the presence of Jesus Christ or separated from Him. But God says life is valuable. Life is valuable in the womb. Life is valuable right at the end. God gives life, and life is to be protected. The unborn and the oldborn, huh? God gave you life. God made you. You can be thankful that God not only made you, God saved you. Titus 3, 5. He saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of His own mercy. God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 1, 9. God has saved us and has called us to a holy life. I like that. He not only saved you, but He saved you to serve. He not only called you to salvation, but He called you to sanctification, the Bible says. Uh, he saved me and He left me. He didn't save me and take me. He saved me and left me. Well, what am I supposed to do with this life? Well, whatever I want. When I get it together... When I'm not just looking at survival, when I'm not just concerned about my success, oh, I'm pressing my luck. When I'm looking at it from the position of significance, then I really care about not my comfort, but his happiness, right? Not my pleasure, but his. It's not just about what I'm getting out of this, but what he's getting out of this. He saved me and he left me here to live a holy life. But I'm not going to live a holy life unless I'm looking at life from his point of view. If I'm looking at life from my point of view, shoot, I'm going to think everything is about me. I'm going to think Jesus' death on the cross was for me. I'm going to think the Holy Spirit is for me. He's my butler. He's my genie. All I have to do is ask and He gives. Holy Spirit's not here for you. Now, the Holy Spirit chose to be here for you. But once we start getting to the place where we treat the Holy Spirit like genie, you know, genie, dun, 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 dun. You're not old enough to remember genie. We've missed it. When you treat God, the Holy Spirit, like your personal butler, you are totally in the flesh. When we treat God like He belongs to us, like everything is about us, we've missed it. But He tells us it's okay to be thankful for the things that we see uh, as believers trying to live like believers. Uh, I see that He made me. Thank you, God. I see that you saved me. Thank you, God. You know me, don't you, God? Thank you. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. God knows you. And this passage says, He not only knows you so that you can just sit back and say, What did I say? He not only knows you so that you can sit back and say, Yay, God knows me. But He knows me, and I'm supposed to do something with this relationship. I'm supposed to turn away from what? Wickedness. That means watch my potty mouth. That means watch what I watch. It means watch what I do. It means quit acting like a sinful, yucky, nasty. Start looking like a saint, whatever the heck a saint looks like. I don't mean the plaster of Paris, gold, wood, statue. I'm not talking about that kind of saint. I'm talking about what the Bible says that you are. You've given your life to Jesus Christ. Now look like Jesus Christ. Live like Jesus Christ. God knows you. But I wonder sometimes if you know who you are. Do I remember who I am? <laughs> President Obama, notice the presidential seal Thank up on the... Uh, Hello, everybody. There. We He's cannot still... sustain... Oops. Gary drops... Was that my... Uh... Presidential oh, goodness. seal fell off his podium. That's all right. All of you know who I am.
but I'm sure there's somebody back there that's really nervous right now. I bet somebody is really nervous right there. He knows who he is. The people there knows, know who he is. God knows you, the Bible says. I wonder sometimes if we've forgotten who we are, though. You are a child of God. Do you always look like it? Do I always live like it? Do, do, I, ha do, I, do, I, do I take this life and live it at the gas station or at Albertsons or in a church service or when I'm driving on the freeway or when I'm at school or at work? Do I, do I look like a child of God? Or do I just look like everybody else? Do I just do what everybody else does? Do I just talk like everybody else? Do I just kind of blend? I'm blending, blending here. Do I just blend in? Or do I really look like a child of God? Again, what does a child of God look like? I don't know, but you're going to be different. What comes out of your mouth will be different. What comes out of my life will be different. What comes out of my wallet will be different. I'll prioritize differently. I'll spend my money differently. I'll spend my time differently. I'll spend my hopes, my dreams, my future. I'll try to invest it all for Jesus Christ. But we're all growing. We're all at different levels of spiritual growth. You're far more mature than I in some areas, and, and I would hope that I'm a little more mature than you in some areas. But we're all growing in the faith. I hope you know who you are. God knows who you are. Psalm 103, 14. He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are frail. We're just dust. 1 Samuel 2, 3. Don't keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by Him deeds our deeds are weighed. Uh, we, we, we get to the place sometimes, not, not you. I'm preaching to the choir here. You're here. But there are Christians who sometimes don't act like it. And sometimes you may know a few Christians who act like they're all that. You know what I mean? Like they're God's gift to God. And they're just so special. And their Holy Ghost is bigger than your Holy Ghost. And their relationship with Jesus is more wonderful than your relationship with Jesus. And uh, God knows who you are. God wants us to know who we are too. We're just dust. But we're dust that's been chosen by God. I, I like that. Um, what's next, guys? Where am I? Four. You can be thankful that God also hears you. Psalm 145, verse 19. He fulfills the desire of those who fear Him. He hears the cry. He hears their cry and He saves them. Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. Psalm 4, 3. Know that the Lord has set apart His faithful servant for Himself. The Lord hears when I call to Him. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Psalm 55, 17. Evening, morning, and noon I cry out in distress and he hears my voice psalm 69 33 the lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people I, god knows you god god hears you god made you that that should be comforting but it's also something to just give thanks for uh, in the middle of the night you know i wake up about two i wake up about three thirty i wake up about four and the last few days i've gotten to the place where i'm trying to be more deliberate about just you know, I'm lying there in bed and just talking to God. And, uh, virtually every time I wake up in the middle of the night, I talk to God. But it's usually, hey, God, I, you know, something like that. And I'm trying to be, and I can hear me. It's so nice. I love hearing me snore. It's just, I'm sleeping. This is cool. But to deliberately try to talk to God, to try to make a whole sentence before I'm out again, to, 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 try to, to, to try to have a, a cogent, an understandable conversation with the Lord. I mean, it's kind of one-sided because I don't hear his voice. But I, I kind of know what he has to say. I kind of know what he wants from me. I kind of know who he wants me to be. And, and during that semi-conscious time, I, I'm, I'm trying to be more deliberate. At my 1.32 in the morning, 3, 3.30 in the morning. How, how is it, Dad? You sleep like a baby? I don't remember how that goes. I don't want to know. Never mind. But when I wake up at night, I'm trying to be more deliberate. God, thank you. Uh, last night it was thank you uh, for keeping us safe. God, thank you that I, I feel safe here tonight. Not everybody was. Uh, there, there have been two deaths uh, by fire, I think, just in the last couple of days here in the valley, here right around the church. A little girl and a 60-year-old uh, man, I think 65-year-old man. Uh, you, you don't know. You just don't know. God, thank you. Everything is, and you're gone. Are you ready? Are you saved? Are you ready? 
I mean, you're in church, and so we talk to each other like, hey, you're saved, you're a brother, I'm a sister, and uh, whatever. Are you really saved? Have you really given your life to Jesus Christ? Because at some point, you step out of this life and you go somewhere. And it doesn't matter if you're religious. And it doesn't matter if you're touching all the bases, little Catholic, little Baptist, little this, little that. That isn't the way it works. Have you given all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ? Forgiveness is amazing. Forgiveness is wonderful. Not just the, not just the absence of guilt part of forgiveness, but God forgives us so that all the filth of our sin, all the filth of our guilt is put away. And then He gives us clean robes of righteousness that we get to put on. He wants us to look different, smell different, smell different. Did I do that right? Smell different. Did I do that right? He wants you to smell different. He wants you to smell, look, sound different. He wants you to act in a different way. He saved us and He put off all the filth of, this, of, of sin. And he, and he really wants you to put off all the filth of the world. And we run to it like little piggies. And we run right back to it. Uh, Peter said we run back like dogs to vomit. I prefer the pigs to, you know, yeah. And, and Jesus cleans us all up and the Holy Spirit scrubs us all up and he puts a little red bow on us and we're so pretty and we're just, little, we're just so cute. And as soon as he turns us loose, right back to the pig pen. And we're doing everything the world does again. The Holy Spirit takes away the filth of sin. You get to keep off the filth of this world. Don't put it back on. Don't put on what they're wearing. Stand away from them. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his, his captive people. I, I'm not in bondage to the Assyrians. I'm not in bondage to the Babylonians. My bondage is more like pride and potato chips. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm a captive too. And in the middle of the night, I'm thanking God for safety. And I'm begging God for help. I'm begging God to let me look like a person who is not in control of my life. Not out of control, but under his control. And it might be my driving. It might be my snacking. It might be my speaking. It might be my joking. It might be my leading. It might be anything. It might be things that I'm doing that are okay. But God, I want people to look at me and say, how does he do that? I want to be like that. I love that people can look at Lauren and say, how does she do that? I want to be like that. I'd love my daughter to be like that. Shoot, I'd love my son to be like that. Shoot, my son, my son wants to be like that. When we got married, he suggested I take the name Hollingsworth and she not take the name Chavis. And <laughs> my kids are grown. I still pray for my kids, don't you? Any of you remember little Tyler used to grow up? Tyler's engaged now. Tyler's going to be married soon. Little 18-year-old old guy. I know. So I don't have to pray for him anymore. You pray more. You pray more for your kids. You pray more for your kids. So during those waking times, God, thank you for my safety. Thank you, God, for my life. Thank you for my wife. Thank you, God, for this church. I thank God for you guys. That's not just preacher talk. I really do. Lauren and I remember the struggle of looking for a church. We remember what it was like to be in between. And I don't know about you. I love church. I love Sunday school. I love the smell of Sunday school classrooms, you know, feet and plastic plants. You know, I love, I love it. I, I got saved and I fell in love with church. But looking for a church where we fit was horribly miserable. It was just miserable. And I didn't fit anywhere. I, my attitude was horrible or I wasn't spiritual enough or I was too wonderful or, you know. Has any of that changed? Yeah. <laughs> Has any of that changed? Actually, no, as a matter of fact. What's changed? God let us kind of find a place. He let us trip over each other. And, and I, I kind of like it here. I hope most pastors love their churches. But this is the kind of church I would like to trip over if I weren't the pastor. I love it here. I love you guys. I appreciate you so much. I take you for granted. I, I don't thank God enough for you. I'm grateful that God let Lauren and me just hang out with you guys. Uh, 
it, it's cool to see your kids grow and stay in the Lord. I, my heart breaks for you when I see our kids grow and they, and they kind of wander off a little bit. We just trust God, bring them back. God, bring them close. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that my kids were protected from a lot of stuff, but they're still in the world. They're still alive. My son, my daughter, saved, love the Lord, serving God in church, serving God in Christian churches. Uh, got a son who's a pastor, got a grandson who wants to be full-time in the ministry, got another grandson who sounds like he wants to be full-time in the ministry. Uh, that's crazy awesome for a preacher. It's crazy. I mean, a little bit of vindication. <laughs> Because you worry that you're wasting your kids' time and you worry that you're wasting your kids' lives. You know, did I teach them the right things? Did I give them the wrong example? Did I show them the right things and I blew it? I, you know, I'm, I'm me. I'm dust. I'm frail. I'm captive to me. God, take care of my kids. God, take care of my grandkids. God, take care of my church. My church, you know what I mean? God, take care of my church. I thank God for the, no one... Is this Baptist to knock on wood? From the, from the time that we've moved into this place, no one's tried to break in. They don't even graffiti the walls, you know, the block walls. We gave them white walls. We gave them lights so the little thugs wouldn't hurt themselves at night when they're tagging the building. And <laughs> You know, the place is like Walmart. You walk in here and, you know, instruments and TVs everywhere. And God's been gracious. He's still gracious and merciful and amazing and wonderful. If tomorrow morning I come in and everything's gone, I thank God for you. Uh, and then usually by then I'm asleep. <laughs> My prayers are a little bit longer, a little bit longer when I pray for you guys in the middle of the night. Uh, God hears the captive. God hears those who are still struggling. And if you're not struggling, that's not good. I don't want you to hurt. I don't want you to be having a hard time. But if you're not struggling, uh, you know the phrase, any dead fish can float downstream. Yeah. If you're not struggling, you're not changing. You're too comfortable in your sin or you're too comfortable in your flesh. You're too comfortable in the world. And that's why I beat on you guys and yell at you about silly, superficial, supercilious things like drinking, dancing, gambling, Adding, piercing. What you have is great, but this is a new life. Where I am now is different. Be different. Who you are is who you are, and I love you, and I'm glad. I, we're here. We're here. But from this point, no more drinking, no more partying, no more. I'm not saying don't have fun. I'm saying don't look like the world. Jesus Christ took the filth of sin off of you. You get to keep the filth of the world off of you. And if it's still on you, that's your fault, not his. Does that make sense? What are you going to do? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable service. Be no longer uh, conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let the Word of God get into your heart. Let the Word of God get into your head. Let the Word of God move out through your hands. Let the Word of God reach people for Jesus. I'm here to help you make God happy. I'm here to help you reach your neighbors for Jesus. I'm here to help you reach your family and your friends. That's why I'm here. Help me help you. Help me help you. I'm here to help you make Him happy. Help me help you. You do that when you come. Every once in a while, you'll show up with another case of waters. You'll, somebody will you'll be walking through Albertsons, and, 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 and you're picking up a 12-pack of Cokes. You'll pick up another 12-pack and bring them to the church. Some of you come, and, 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 and you'll offer to take care of the, the lawn or, or, or weeds once in a while. I appreciate, appreciate those of you who come, and, you, and you, you clean once in a while, or you just, you just kind of offer to do things. Listen, we need to do everything here you need to do at your house, just bigger or more, or we're dirtier, or I don't know what. You know, when, when, when you're at the store, pick up some candy. Pick up Hershey's Kisses. Pick up Tootsie Rolls. I don't mean from here. I'm not helping you stock up for Halloween. Take one or two and leave some for the next guy. But when you're at the store, pick stuff up and bring it. It's okay. That comes out of somebody's pocket. 
help me help you. Yeah. You, 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 you see a shadow with the door and you look around, oh, it's, it's somebody I know. It's just Jerry. It's just Greg. You know. But you turn around, you see somebody walk through the door and you don't know who it is. Make a little room. It's okay to make eye contact. Don't do like I do. Make eye contact, but you know, make eye, let them know that it's okay to sit by you. Make a little room. You know, I put my boots and my purse and my Bible and my microwave and my tea right here on my table, right there in front of me. Make a little room. You know, you don't have to sit like this. We, we set up the church like this intentionally. I want people who want to feel like church to have church, like Gary. You got pews. I want people who like the tables for your coffee and your cokes. I, I want you to feel comfortable. People who are used to Archie's, well, you've got counters, you know? <sighs> it's a bar. I want you to feel comfortable. I want to create a comfortable environment so that you can invite your family and friends to Jesus. If you're not bringing anybody, this is not a bring somebody. It's not that. I'm telling you, that's why we're here. I'm not here to bring soul-saving messages. I'm here to help you lead your friends and family to Jesus where, where you are. But you're not going to be do, able to do that in your strength, in the flesh. We need to cry out to God. God, make sure I'm plugged into you. God, when I have those opportunities, help me blue book them. You know, there are blue books at that column, at this column, and at the door when you walk out. If you don't know what to say, give them a blue book and say, listen, my preacher likes us to give away blue books. You want to do me a favor? Read this blue book, and next time we talk, we'll, we'll just talk a little about what, what's in it. Do, do you mind? Or if you need to, do like my friend Carl. Grab him by the collar and say, you're on your way to hell. You need to give your life to Jesus and just give him the gospel and try to lead him to the Lord right there. But God hears you when you cry out to Him. Uh, you can be thankful that God also wants you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You want to tell your family. You want to tell your friends. God really wants you. You may remember the movie uh, Angels in the, in a, what is it? Angels in the Outfield, I think. Uh, Roger, I think. Go ahead, guys. Uh, Roger's dad has given him up. Uh, JP uh, has, has been waiting for a family of his own for years. They're staying with Maggie. Maggie's their caregiver. The angels won the pennant. And it's the angels great. finally win the pennant. Well done. Oh, Roger. This is the coach of the angels called. team. What they want? Was it about my father? No, but it is about finding you a permanent home. Oh, finding a permanent home back. for Roger JP, and JP still nothing. Back. You know, nothing is probably ever as good as your real parents. But there's some people who could care for you and love you and take care of you. Yeah. I guess so. Roger, the person who called social service, that was me. I want to try to be a dad. I want you to come and live in my house. You, you. <laughs> <laughs> huh. JP. He's coming too. Yes? I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, what about Maggie? No. My work is here. Don't worry. There are plenty of little angels looking for a home. So, so, so we're going to be a family. Yeah. It's nice to be wanted. Man, never forget, you were wanted in the good way. <laughs> you were wanted by God, and he sought you out. God wanted you. You wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't be here in God's heart. You wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here in my heart, and you wouldn't be here in God's heart if he didn't want you. God wants you.
give your life to Jesus. Can you remember when you got saved? Can you remember when you gave your life to the Lord? Were you at home? Were you at church? Were you flat on your back in a hospital? Were you driving down the freeway? Was your car spinning on black ice somewhere? Were you lying on the floor saying, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do anything for you? Where were you when you gave your life to Jesus? You may not remember. If you can't remember, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Let's just take care of it. If you remember where you were, well, praise God. Thank you, God. I remember where I was. Now, I'm not asking when you were baptized. I, shoot, I want to baptize you. I'm a Baptist preacher. I like throwing people in the horse trough. But that's not going to get you into heaven. When did you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ? When did you let Jesus forgive you? Like he's standing back there. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. But kind of. When did you transfer ownership of your life to Jesus Christ? If you haven't done that, now's the time. Now's the time. When you leave, feel free to pick up a blue book at that black column, at this black column, or at the door when you leave. And I hope you hang out with us. But pick up a blue book. If not for you, for a family member, for a friend, for you don't know who, stick it in your pocket. I used to hate to give out tracts. I first got saved. I got saved in Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. Glory to God. And we were made to feel like if we were not soul winning, we were going to lose our salvation. We weren't going to lose our salvation. But the guilt was really good. It was strong. So I carried tracts in my pocket. And I gave away tracts, but I used to hate it. And so I used to say, hey, listen, come visit my church. Here's the address on the back. I wouldn't say anything about what's on the inside. I used it like a glorified business card. Here's, could you come visit my church? Here's the address on the back. I don't care how you use it. If you never use a blue book, great. I just want to help you make him happy. I want to help you make him happy. He wants you close, and he wants the people in your life close. How are you going to reach him? Invite him to come. Invite him to come. Invite him to come to Jesus. If you don't know what to say, shoot, invite him to come to church. But invite him to come to Jesus. When you invite him to come to church, I'm just going to mess them up. So try to do all you can before they get here. <laughs> Lead them to Jesus because we want everybody to get what? Saved. And then we want them to get what? Soaked. What's the big deal about being baptized? I don't know, but it was big to Jesus. Go ye therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. To the end of the age. So win them to Jesus and then teach them to be obedient. If they won't be obedient in the most obvious things, are they going to be obedient in the secret things? Not likely. Not likely. They may look like they're godly, but they're not if they're not obedient. Not to me, to him. Get them saved. Let's work together. We'll get them soaked. You keep coming to church. You stay in God's word. You'll be getting serious about living for Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. If there's anything we can help you with, there's a blue tearaway in your program. Uh, if, if you've given your life to the Lord, you're saved, and you're ready to be baptized, then I ask everybody for the same thing. When you're ready to be baptized, I want you to bring me a blue book that's been filled out and signed by you. I want you to bring me a tearaway that's been filled out and torn out. Bring it to me and I'll trade you one of these for one of those. This gives me an opportunity to open up a spiritual conversation with you and find out when you got saved and if you're serious about living for him. If you're not serious about living for him, I'll throw you in there anyway just so I can count you. Try not to. I want you to follow the Lord in baptism because it means you're being obedient. But you can get into heaven without being baptized. You can't get into heaven without being saved. Give your life to Jesus. Where were you? Do you remember? I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. This will be our, our prayer of dismissal. This will be our prayer where the service is over. And hang around and eat. I don't know what I cooked, but it's good. By the way, don't the guys do great? The people who take care of the cafe and the cooking area. You guys are great. Jerry oversees it. I think Marcella and Orlando are taking care of it today. But uh, uh, thank you guys for doing that. That's not to feed you, by the way. Of course, eat. I'm not, I'm not feeding the South Valley. I'm not, I, I, this is an opportunity to hang out and get to know each other. Don't grab your plate and scurry off to the corner. I'm going to run you out of that other corner. Come get to know people. Come hang out over here. It's so that you can hang out and get to know people. It's not so you can get in your little corner. Get in somebody else's corner. Get all up in their business. Get to know people. You're going to be uncomfortable. They're going to be uncomfortable. Then you're going to be like best buds forever. I want this to be a comfortable place for you. Some of you people are crazy and you hang out for the 10 o'clock service too. I love you. Thank you. 
You know, some of the people here at the 830 service are kind of missionaries. They're 10 o'clock people, but they like being here at 8 o'clock so that they're warm bodies when y'all show up. Thank you, guys. For those of you that come to both, sometimes you, you'll eat at both services, yet you hang out. I love that. I appreciate that. You're here between kind of straightening up between services. You're helping me help you make him happy. Between times, you're checking the bathrooms, make sure there are no surprises. You know what I mean? No surprises, lids down, lights on. Make it nice for the next guy. I'm not saying you're not keeping things clean. Everything's great. I'm saying this is how you can help me help you make him happy. Think about what your place looks like because this place was for you until you got here. Now this place is for whoever you're going to bring next. People used to get mad at me when I'd say that and I quit saying it. Doggone it, I need to say it again. This place was for you until you got here. Now it's for whoever you're going to bring next. Make it comfortable for them. Reach them for Jesus. Help them become obedient to Jesus. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get out of here and go eat. Hang around as long as you can. At 1130, we're going to have a, a, a Christmas gift packing party again. If you want to hang out with us for the second service, and then after, that's great. If you want to leave and do split shift, is that what it's called, where you come back and help? That's great. Uh, if you just want to pray for the crazies who are here doing that, that's wonderful, too. I love that you guys are doing things outside of the body. One last thing, and we're going to pray. Uh, for those of you who are kind of new with us, on that wall and on that wall, and I think on that wall, you'll see little posters that are up there, and they say uh, beyond the walls, I think, along the top. You are involved. We don't pass the plate. We have offering kiosks, but we don't pass the plate. Money that you give, it, I, yeah, there's electricity and water bills and food and stuff like that. Most of the money that you give goes to those beyond the walls ministries. You're involved in 12, 13, 14, 15 different ministries that are involved in hundreds. Some of those ministries are involved in hundreds themselves of other ministries. You're reaching people for Jesus. You're involved in disaster relief. You're involved in training new pastors. You are involved with 40,000 other Southern Baptist works in the States. You are involved with 40,000 mission endeavors around the world. Plus... And Southern Baptist entities cooperate with uh, other missionary organizations. So we're not just working in our little Southern Baptist uh, ghetto. We're reaching the world for Jesus Christ, and we're not doing a great job. I mean, there's still a lot of people who need to be saved. But we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it. And I just want you to know that when you give, that money is going far beyond these walls. R really a small percent is staying here. God, 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 use us. God, use us. God, use us. God, use us. Thank you for everyone who's here. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to pay the price to forgive my sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to die on the cross to pay for every one of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you willingly, deliberately, intentionally allowed yourself to be beaten and crucified that I might be saved. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Jesus, please, please, please let people see the changes in my life. Thank you for putting away the filth of sin. Jesus, help me do a better job of putting away the filth of this world. Some of the stuff that gets on us from the world maybe doesn't look all that yucky. Might be kind of fun. Might be something we just kind of like. Jesus, help us like more of what you like. Help us hate more of what you hate. Help us love more of what you love. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for using us. Use us more and more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Hang around for a while if you can.